Words at War. As the bell of San Lorenzo proclaims the curfew hour, I call out to you, Ave, Duce, Ave. Can you hear me? This is Rome speaking to you. Rome the eternal. Rome the ancestral home of all the Caesars. I am calling you, Duce. You, the magnetic, the histrionic the dynamic hypnotist of the mob. You, the soldier, the statesman, the liar, the orator, journalist, philanderer. You who so enriched the dictionary of invective and shameful phrases. You who were the hope of the rich and the poor and who crushed both the weak and the strong. You who once told an ignorant crowd there is no God and held up a cheap pocket watch, daring God to strike you dead in five minutes. You who another time compared yourself to Jesus Christ, but who threw his followers into jail. I hail you, Duce. Wherever you are tonight, listen to me. I would commune with you, laugh with you, relive history with you while all men listen. And do not be frightened, Duce. What if I do reveal to the masses some of the things you'd rather keep quiet? The stupid masses whom you've always hated and despised. Tonight, Duce, while the armored cars of your gentle friends rumble through my ancient streets, while their hobnailed boots goose-step the pattern of tyranny into the soil of my seven hills... I, Rome, cry out in salutation for all the blessings you have brought me. Ave, Duce. Hail, great leader. This is another in the Words at War programs presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime. Tonight's script, written by Richard McDonough, is based on three important books. Herbert L. Matthews' Fruits of Fascism, George Seldes' Sawdust Caesar, and Eleanor and Reynolds Packard's Balcony Empire. Ethiopia. Dolce! 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 We have been forced to intervene in Spain. Dolce! 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 We are being attacked by Albania. Dolce! 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 Do you remember it, Duce? That scene that took place so often during the 20 fascist years. You on your balcony, Roman jaw out thrust, hands on hips, nostrils wide and dark eyes flashing, while below in the square of Venice, 100,000 pitiful little people bellowed at your black shirt signal. Today we face history. Italy can do no other. We go to war against France and England. Yes, Duce. They even cheered the cruelest trick of all, your famous stab in the back. Do you remember their cheers? Of course you do. 
How could any Caesar ever forget the adulation of the Roman throngs? And what cry could ever strike as close to your heart as, Duce, Duce? Unless it were that other cry with which they greeted you once before. Do you remember it, Duce? Who paid you? Do you remember that, Duce? Your legions beneath the balcony had long forgotten it. But you and I remember, don't we, Duce? It was in Milan in 1915. The Italian nationalists were crying to their countrymen, Let us save democracy and preserve civilization by joining the Allies. It is Italy's duty to fight. That's what the nationalists said, Duce. But your socialist party had voted for strict neutrality. And the loudest and most violent of all the socialist pacifists was a man named Mussolini. Don't you recall how on September 21st, 1915, at the Socialist Party Convention at Bologna, you rose to new pacifist heights of violence that shocked the belligerent world and brought tears of joy to the eyes of Lenin and Trotsky? I say the neutrality of the Italian Socialist Party is not enough. Your anti-war effort is infantile and will remain so unless you become revolutionary. Follow me and preach and work for the way of communism in France and Belgium. Down with the Allies. Down with Tsardoms, kingdoms and republics. Up with the dictatorship of the proletarian masses. Oh, how you captured their hearts that September 21st, Duce. But they didn't know what you know, did they, Duce? They didn't even suspect until four days later, September 25th, when you completely reversed yourself in the socialist paper that had been committed to your care. I call on all Italy to join me, to take up arms, to march to the front on the side of ravished France and martyred Belgium. Oh, it was funny to see the faces of those betrayed socialists, wasn't it, Duce? And the suspicious minds they had, too. Remember how they called a convention to expel you from the party? And when you entered the hall, they greeted you with a great chorus. Who paid you, they asked. They were suspicious realists those socialists. It was wonderful. The way you shrugged off their charges and busied yourself turning out your new daily paper, Il Popolo d'Italia. Benito Mussolini, sole owner. Yes, indeed. Still, remembering the socialist charge, remembering that you've never earned more than ten lira a week in your life, and remembering that it costs a great deal of money to establish a big metropolitan newspaper... Would it be too impertinent to ask at this late date, who did pay you, Duce? And so, Duce, for the price of a newspaper, you helped push Italy into World War I. True, you went yourself. Public opinion forced you to. And in the trenches, a mortar exploded one day and you got yourself 42 wounds. But none of them were fatal, unfortunately. And after the war, Italy was in chaos. But you were not disturbed. Not you, Duce. You sat in your editorial chair in Milan and sized up the situation. You weighed everything carefully, and then you summed up. Uh, here am I, Benito Mussolini, the son of a hard-drinking blacksmith. Here am I on the raft of opportunity in the middle of a seething ocean of mass hatred. Italy's being torn apart by the greed of her capitalists on the one hand and the demands of her workers on the other. Now, what can I get out of this? Oh, it was good to see a realist at work, Duce. So refreshing. How am I, Mussolini, going to profit by this terrible state in which my country finds herself? I uh, 
could counsel both management and labor against excesses. I could counsel moderation, spirit of understanding. But what will be in it for me if I do that? Uh, I need more. And I'm going to get more. I'll uh, play on their likes and dislikes, on their beliefs and their fears. I'll discredit the government, pit class against class, trim my sails to any wind that blows, and who knows? Someday I, Mussolini, may rule the destiny of Italy. Giovanetta, Giovanetta, Primavera di Valenta, Nel Pacismo e la Sorezza, Della Nostra Libertà. Giovanetta, youth, youth, springtime of beauty. In fascism is the salvation of our freedom. Thus did they sing, Duce, those followers of yours. Malcontents all, you called them together. You gave them black shirts and golden promises. You gave them a marching hymn. And you called them fascists. Then in 1919, you made your first real bid for power. You ran for parliament as the Milan representative. Listen to me, O Milanese. I, Mussolini the leader of the fascist black shirts, will represent you in the Parliament of Rome. Fascists? What are they? Who are they? The fascists are the hope of Italy. The name fascism is derived from the Latin fascis, the old Roman symbol of authority. And that's what Italy needs today in a government. Authority. What is your platform? It's simple, clear, direct, and unchangeable. I, Mussolini favor the expropriation of land, mines, and transportation. These, now held by the rich, I will return to the people, who are the real owners of the nation's wealth. I am anti-church and anti-monarchy. I am for the people, to the poor citizens of Milan, and vote for Mussolini, the fascist black shirt. And they did as you directed them, Duce. They voted for Mussolini, nearly 5,000 of them. Unfortunately, though, 341,000 voted for your opponent. Oh, this is intolerable, incomprehensible. I offer them a proletarian platform and they reject me. I win 5,000 votes against my opponent's 341,000. Obviously, something is wrong, Duce. Yes, we, we must try something else. Very well. If I can't win the masses, I'll appeal to the landlords and the property classes. But, but how, Duce? How will you appeal to them? They're afraid of uh, Bolshevism, aren't they? Yes. And I, Mussolini, shall become the great anti-Bolshevik. Wonderful. Yes, yes, yes but, uh, but Duce, you yourself have said in a public speech, how can anyone think communism is possible in Italy, the most individualistic country in the world? If there is no Bolshevism, how can you fight Bolshevism? I uh, direct you to forget that speech as of this moment. Uh, oh, yes, 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 Duce, yes. When, uh, when people are afraid of ghosts, it's easy to create ghosts. We shall create Bolshevists. Every strike, every labor disturbance, no matter how trivial, must be labeled communism. And when there are no labor troubles, we'll create them. Avadi fascists, on to our sacred duty to save Italy from Bolshevism. It worked, Duce, it worked. Oh, weren't you the sly one, though? It was the most beautiful bit of rabble-rousing Italy had ever seen. It was so simple. All you had to do was call yourselves patriotic, nationalistic Italians, scream down with Bolshevism, and label everyone who opposed you as communists. 
The more noise you made, the more financial support flowed into the party coffers. Contributions from the merchants' associations. Benign non-interference from religious leaders. Thousands of lira from the Masonic Order. Millions from petty bourgeois individuals who sincerely hated communism. Avanti fascists, save Italy from Bolshevism. Then the following year, 1920. It is over. The election is over. Results, please. Your fascist party, Duce, has won 32 seats out of 502. No. It wasn't as good as you'd expected, Duce. But it was a start. A good start. It gave your hoodlums just the encouragement they needed to bring in new members to the fascist party and to stamp out opposition. My, oh, my, how those boys could wield the whip, the knife, and the flaming torch. It was a trifle rough, though, and I admit I was worried there for a while. It looked as though the brains of every other Italian would be decorating our gutters. Then along came that astute young man named Balbo, with his idea for a new use of castor oil. Ah, there was an up-and-coming young fellow, Duce. Too bad he afterward became too popular, causing you to get rid of him. But your fascist machine smashed forward on its way to national influence and international repute, fired by fear and greased by graft and castor oil. But you at its helm were not content with 32 seats in Parliament, and so full of that confidence which is so often an attribute of egomaniacs and paretics, you made the big decision on October 28, 1922. <laughs> Black shirt legions, now I give the immortal order. Avanti, march! Giovanezza, Giovanezza, prima bella di Valletta, Nervosismo e la Sametta. The march on Rome. Actually, it wasn't much of a triumphal march, you'll recall, Duce. You yourself prudently stayed behind in Milan, waiting to see what would happen. I, Rome, was positive your attempted coup d'etat would fizzle out ingloriously. I was sure of it when I looked into the heart of Badoglio, the army's chief of staff. You know, Duce, there's a lot I detest about Badoglio, but his one saving grace has always been that he hates you and everything you stand for. And he gave me a happy moment when he went storming into the Quirinal that day to see the king... Your Majesty. Yes, Badoglio. You are alarmed by this fascist march on Rome? Irritated, Your Majesty. Annoyed. Not alarmed. Give me the authority to lead just one division of Basilieri against them and I'll sweep them into the sea. Ah, Duce, that was a moment in history. You know and I know that Badoglio could have done what he promised the king. But Victor of Savoy took time out to reason. If I allow you to fight Badoglio... There will be civil war, and in civil war, the House of Savoy may lose the throne. I half expected Badoglio to remind the king that his first duty was to Italy and not to his own family. But poor Badoglio was hushed by the royal presence and merely said, Whatever is your wish, sire. Oh, how Italy needed a strong man that day, Duce. If she'd had one... The king would never have sent you the telegram to come and form a government. Italy would not have unsheathed her knife to stab her neighbor in the back. Her people would have retained their honored place among the nations of the world. And your friends from north of the Brenner would not be tramping through my streets tonight. But what's the use of dreaming? Italy had no strong man. And the king did send you the wire. And you came. And fascist violence quickened its course. We are pleased to report, Duce, that today we wrecked two more newspapers of the opposition. We sacked the city of Bologna today for not playing ball with us. We drove out the town council, burned the chamber of labor to the ground, smashed the presses of the newspaper that had been critical, and murdered five communist workers.
10,000 new members of the fascist party enrolled this month, all paying dues. Signor Farinacci requests additional appropriations for clubs and castor oil. Two priests who had spoken unwisely in their pulpits were taken to the hospital this week. Report of accomplishments for first five months of 1921, Duce. Labor Union headquarters invaded 120. Socialist centers destroyed 243. Communist working men killed 202. Communist workers wounded 1,144. It developed afterwards that one of the 202 communists killed was not a communist, so we awarded him a posthumous membership in the fascist party and inscribed his name on the honor roll of fascist martyrs. Yes, your power and influence grew, Duce. But there was criticism. You were not yet the dictator. You were merely prime minister of Italy. So there was criticism. And the most galling of all your critics was the leader of the socialist deputies in parliament, Matteotti. You have no idea how anguished I was for you when Signor Matteotti would arise in the chamber and take you to account. Matteotti, the gadfly armed with two stings, irony and humor. Day after day, he would come at you, hurling your own words down your throat while you squirmed and frowned and muttered threats. And again, I ask a question of the Honorable Prime Minister. I see by your own admission that Bolshevism is dead. Yet now you declare the chief object of the fascist party is to fight Bolshevism. You wouldn't whip a corpse, would you? Remember how even your friends in the chamber grinned at that one, don't you? If, as the Honorable Prime Minister has said, Italy was saved by the fascist party in 1919, why does she need so much saving today? How do you explain the civil war which your fascists have inaugurated, their destructions, their burnings, their assassinations? How do you explain it, Honorable Prime Minister? He was nasty, wasn't he, Duce? How do you explain that fascism playing the adulteress has passed from the bed of the working class to the bed of the capitalist class, betraying each in turn as fancy dictates? How do you explain it? You really ought to have had a better answer for him than just mumbling traitor, coward. You really ought to, do you? You have denounced financiers as brigands. You have fought the army. You have attacked the clergy. You have denied that God exists. Yet today you are the chief defender of these persons and ideas. How do you explain yourself? Yes, Duce. The man was unbearable. There's such a thing as carrying free speech too far. It was just as well you had him assassinated. But your hoodlums ought to have been more careful in committing the Matteotti murder. The terrible scandal it created was almost the end of the fascist party there for a while. So, Duce, please be more careful next time. If there is a next time. And then, Duce, you decided you'd waited long enough. You called in your henchmen, remember? The Matteotti assassination has proved that we can get away with anything. So now is the time to strike. What do we do, Duce? It's time so-called liberal Italy gave way to totalitarian Italy. All those things built up by Garibaldi and the liberals must go. Press, parliament, Freemasons, all of them. I, Mussolini, shall be more than a Duce. I, Mussolini, shall be the supreme dictator. I, Mussolini, shall be Italy. It is decreed. If any newspaper or periodical causes any interference in the diplomatic action of the government and its foreign relations, or hurts the credit of the nation at home or abroad, causing undue alarm among the people, or in any way disturbs the peace, such newspapers or other periodicals shall be suppressed. Ah, Duce, wasn't it smart of you to silence the press first? After that, there was nothing to stop your issuing your other laws by decree in quick succession. It is decreed that from this day forward, the right of public association is abolished. That destroys Freemasonry. It is decreed that the Chamber of Deputies is now a consultative body. It may discuss and ratify laws. It may initiate no laws of its own, only those approved by the Duce. That takes care of Parliament. It is decreed that all functionaries who place themselves in a situation incompatible with the political directives of the government may be removed. That forces the teachers into line. It is decreed that hereafter anyone criticizing the head of the government will be punishable with six to 30 months imprisonment and a fine of not less than 300 or more than 3,000 lira. That stops free speech. 
It is decreed that all power over the army and navy shall henceforth be exercised by the Duce and not by the king. And that takes care of everything. Yes, Duce. You took care of everything. And you know, it was really a good joke when you come to look back at it. There were all those people, the little ones, I mean. They were disgruntled and dissatisfied. Along you came to promise them an easy utopia. And they either voted you into office or failed to stop you when you decided to take over. You certainly took care of them, didn't you? And the king. You certainly made him a jack-in-the-box, didn't you? Why, you even betrayed Pope Pius XI. Yes, Duce. You betrayed them all. People, king, and pope. Well, Duce, the noise of the cheering legions has faded from the square of Venice. All that's heard now is the footfalls of Nazi sentries, the distant rumble of the Allied guns, and the bell in the tower of San Lorenzo. How like a funeral knell it sounds. And do you wonder for whom it tolls? If so, listen hard, Duce. Hear that at the noise? Something reminiscent of a cheap pocket watch ticking and ticking away. While with flamboyant oratory, a cheap demagogue dares God to prove he is in his heaven by striking with swift justice. Do you hear it, Duce? It is the clock of providence that ticks on and on. The hour of reckoning is near at hand. Even the longest years are made up of tiny seconds. And the seconds slip away one by one into eternity. Listen, Duce. Listen. Words at War has presented tonight a radio treatment of the disease known as fascism, inspired by and based on three informative books, Fruits of Fascism by Herbert L. Matthews, Sawdust Caesar by George Seldes, and Balcony Empire by Reynolds and Eleanor Packard. Our script was prepared by Richard McDonough of the NBC script staff. The Voice of Rome was played by Grace Coppin and Mussolini by Arnold Moss, with Ted Osborne, Roger DeCoven, Gene Leonard and Alexander Scorby as the supporting players. The music was composed and conducted by Morris Mamorsky, and the entire production was directed by Frank Papp. Next Tuesday, December 7th, Words at War will present A Book of War Letters, another in this series of war book adaptations brought to you in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime by the National Broadcasting Company and the independent radio stations associated with the NBC network. This program came to you from New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Mm.